Bob, welcome. Thanks for taking the time and uh, coming over here. I assume it's the first time in the <laughs> studio for both <laughs> of you, us sir. in this place. Uh, nice what I'd here. like to do is talk to you a little bit about how you came to Singapore. Also, why, uh, what has made it interesting in doing what you're doing in Singapore. Uh, but before we start, let me ask about uh, what got you into medicine. How did you get into medicine? What well, was your interest? Well, Ranga, I'm one of those folks who always known I was going to be a physician. Uh, in fact, I always knew that I was going to be a pediatrician. And uh, it, my reasons for going into medicine changed over my, my uh, childhood when I first uh, was a child thinking about, I was so impressed with my own pediatrician. So that was my, he was my first inspiration. And then as I went through, and uh, I just really saw that as a great way for me to be of service to others. And I love be working with, with children and families. So as I went through my career, it just was, became clearer and clearer that pediatrics was indeed the right choice for me. But it was a choice that I made when I was really little. And my parents would have been shocked if I did anything but pediatrics. So really, a pediatrician was your first role model in many ways. Right, right. But I will also say that um, a along with medicine and pediatrics, I've also always considered myself an educator. In fact, one of the reasons why pediatrics was such a good fit for me is in pediatrics, we do so much education of families and children. So uh, I remember when I was interviewed for medical school, and one of the interviewers asked me, Bob, if you couldn't do medicine, what would you do? And my, my quick answer was, oh, I'd be a teacher. And so I, it's been great to have a career where I've been, I've been able, able to, to combine, combine both. both. Yeah, it's been so perfect for me. You, start, you lived in California, right? Is I grew up in California. Grew up in I grew Cal up in Southern California but then went to uh, university and medical school in Northern California, in the Bay Area. And where did you, what did you do in university? What was your first degree? Well, oh, okay. So I was a human biology major. So that actually was one of the largest majors at Stanford. It's an interdisciplinary major, which included biology, sociology, psychology, economics. Um, and so it was different than the hard science in the, of biology or chemistry or biochemistry. But it was a degree that incorporated biologies with systems and population biology. So it was uh, much uh, more, it was the kind of biology I was mostly interested in. So in many ways, you exemplify somebody right from childhood who knew what, we, what you were going to do. And in, you succeeded in getting there. Right. I like to think, though, that I, that I evaluated as I went along whether or not it was the right fit for me. Okay. I think that that's important. In fact, one of the things when I talk to our, my, my students, I ask them, even though you might have an idea of what you want to do, keep your, try to keep your eyes open uh, for other things. But for me, it was clear that everything fit, that this was indeed the right choice. So while you were going through school and university, were there times when you thought maybe other careers? You said the answer you gave is teaching, but was it other things? <laughs> well, uh, no, not really. Not really. Okay. I, because I, I saw w one of the beautiful things about medicine, and you know this, Ranga, is that there's so much you can do in medicine. It's a platform to do education or research or uh, law or business. It really is a uni almost a universal, per, uh, st uh, great starting point. So I, as I was thinking about different things that I would do in my life, I, I, I saw that medicine was a great platform for that. And I was fortunate enough to always do well enough in school that would have the opportunities to do that through medicine. And so after you studied at uh, Stanford, where did you go to medical school? I went to medical school at, at the Univers University of California, San Francisco. So right, right up next the, way. Yeah, right <laughs> up the street. Okay. And that was, a, um, that was quite a shift from, you know, Stanford is the countryside, it's beautiful, and then uh, UCSF was in the city, and San Francisco was, was uh, as a city, is so much different than the suburbs of, of Palo Alto where Stanford is. But it gave me the kind of medical school education I was interested in, one where there was a, a diverse patient populations, um, all sorts of different types of people. It had public institutions as well as a lot of research. 
and it put me actually in the city of San Francisco, which um, which I love to, to. Yeah, it's a great city. Yeah. So when you after you studied medicine, and it looks like you were clear you were going to pediatrics, which is also pretty unusual. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so where did you look around? Where did you end up going to pediatrics? Okay, so after medical school, um, you do your residency training. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, for my training. So um, the other, it's fondly known as CHOP. And CHOP uh, was founded by Benjamin Franklin. It's the first uh, children's, hospital children's hospital in yeah. the United States. And it has, so it has an amazing history. But at the time, it also had for me not only history, but it had the right balance of, of general pediatrics as well as specialty pediatrics. And so it was really, it was an interesting place for me to go. A lot of times people say, why would you go from San Francisco, where everyone wants to live, to Philadelphia, where at the time, nobody wanted, <laughs> no to, one wanted to go. So they said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry you're moving to Philadelphia. And I said, no, no. Uh, this was really where I wanted to be. It was one of the best programs yes. in pediatrics yes. in the country, right? Yes, and it continues to be. Um, I was uh, invited as a speaker last year to give a, a, a talk there, and it was it was give grand rounds there. It was such a pleasure to go back there um, and see my old stomping grounds. It's changed. It's changed quite a bit. It must have tripled in size, in size yeah. and um, it's doing so beautifully as a hospital. Um, and, and it continues with an incredible academic tradition, one that um, I see happening here. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been great. So after completing your residency, you went back to California? I did. I was in private practice to start, um, mainly because I, I felt that a general practice was the right, again, the right training for what I'd want to do. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I knew that uh, time as a general practitioner, really getting to know families, getting to know uh, children, um, and, and their real life problems was, uh, was a, an, again, another f important foundation. Sounds like you're following your role model right through. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Years. Exactly. But then you moved back into an academic right. setting, right? Right. So what happened was, I was, um, I considered it training mm -hmm. to be in a, in a general practice because I learned so much and it was so hard work. Um, and then I decided though that, uh, that I wanted to achieve more in medicine than I could just in practice. And to do that, I wanted to be around students, I, again, my interest in education. So I, I uh, took a job as a general practitioner at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, where I medical school. And I, was, I started a general practice there and be, be, actually had the largest pediatric practice of all the faculty at UCSF when I was in practice there. And are there any memorable things from practicing pediatrics? Oh, there should be. Yes, there's, there's tons. I think maybe um, the one that, uh, the most memorable experience I, I could think of right now was something that epitomizes really my love of pediatrics and it was um, it wasn't a single event but it was um, many of many a continuous event and it goes to the to um, I took care of a lot of the uh, staff and faculty at UCSF mm -hmm. their kids their kids and uh, because I had the reputation as I was the person to to go see and so I, I knew I could walk around campus and I knew just about everyone Mm -hmm. because I took care of so many families. And uh, I remember taking care of uh, this woman's uh, baby who was, uh, who was at working in the parking lot at the time. And I would see her in the parking lot. And, um, and then the, the baby was very healthy and, and I saw her for all of her life. And then it was my last day at UCSF before moving to Singapore. And I happened to run into her. And by this time, she was like head of security in the parking lot. And she said, Dr. Kame, Dr. Kame, I have to, so, I have to show you a picture of Jamia, which <laughs> is, um, she's now graduated from college. <laughs> she was, you know, six foot two. <laughs> and she had this picture. And um, it was so great to, to really bookend, I guess, my career at UCSF, where, you know, I took care of her when she was a baby. And as I leave uh, UCSF, she's, 
to see a picture of her was just very special. So how many years was that? Well, that it was almost 20 in. years at UCSF. Um, of that time, uh, almost 17 years as a pediatric program director, so in charge of education. You must have been one of the program. longest serving program directors in right, pediatrics. Right, right. Um, I came in at a time where um, education wasn't a, a common career in, in, in the university. So I, when I started as a director of, a, as a, of the residency training program, one of the things I said to my boss at the time was, okay, I'm, I'm willing to do this job, I really like to do this job, but I really wanted to make it my academic pursuit. I really wanted to understand education more mm. in this. So I need you to support that. I need you to give me some additional time, be, be, in addition to running the program, to really uh, advance myself academically. And so, um, so this was a new thing. This really wasn't happening at the, at the time uh, I started. And so there were, you know, there's growing pains with being a pioneer in that way. Um, but it was it was just a great career for me. So it did become a training ground for coming here in many ways. Yes. The experience. Of, yes. Uh, I often talk about when we are developing faculty here, uh, and the and the faculty here in education, and the faculty here don't have the advantages um, of of other educators. Um, like I had at UCSF when I left, mm -hmm. but it was very similar to UCSF when I when began. When you started. Yeah. So before coming to Singapore, you've clearly been in Asia before. Yes. Tell me a little bit about what attracted you to Asia. Well, it's a, it's a funny story. When I was a medical student, I lived in the Haight-Ashbury. Mm -hmm. The Haight-Ashbury is uh, where the flower yeah. children and uh, where... But that was 60. after. Yes, the, that was after. But it's still okay. a very unique neighborhood. Right. So I would walk along the Haight-Ashbury to work. And I, uh, as I went down the street, there was a man who had a hair salon. Hmm. And he would stand um, out, he had a Dutch door, so the doors where the, the top half and the bottom half were separate, so you can keep the top half open. And he would oftentimes just stand at the door, just watching people go by. So we got to know each other pretty well, because I walked by his hair salon every day. And we became friends. And he uh, is a Singaporean. Um, and he cut hair, and we and we became friends just from being in the neighborhood. Well, I uh, when I went away to Philadelphia for my residency and went back to San Francisco, he said, "Bob, I'm I'm not no longer going to cut hair. I want to open a restaurant." So I said, oh, "That's great, Chris. Uh, do you know anything about restaurants?" And he goes, "Well, I used to work at the Mandarin and and on Orchard." And so I said, "Okay, great." So. Uh, I had just come back to San Francisco, and I said, okay, I'm going to help you uh, open up your first restaurant. So we went in, and we painted it. It was a small little place, and his mom was the first cook. And in this restaurant, I really got to know Singapore food. Mm -hmm. So for uh, most of my adult life, I grew up eating at his restaurant and eating Singapore food. Um, now, his restaurant has grown from this little tiny place to multi-million dollar restaurants. He's got about five of them all over the country now. So he's really, and one of the top restaurateurs in San Francisco. Mm. So he's really been quite successful and it's been fun to watch him achieve that success from this little tiny restaurant. But um, it's been a great education about, about Singapore uh, culture and food that I had. In fact, my first trip to Singapore was about uh, 20 years ago and was him, with him and his family. And we went, went around to all his favorite eating places, eating places in Little India and in La Passat and all the places that he loved to go as a kid. I remember going around with him 20 years ago. So Singapore has obviously changed quite a bit. And I remember um, coming to interview for the job here in Singapore and this time and calling him on the phone from the airport and said, Chris, you, know, you don't know where I'm, gonna, where I'm heading now for my, first, for my interview. It's Singapore. Hmm. So I think it was sort of meant to be that I was. So you were already connected here. to Singapore yes. even before you came here. Yes, and okay. the other connection I had with Singapore was in 2000. Um, I did a Fulbright fellowship. Now, in the United States, uh, the State Department sponsors scholars to go from United States to a country, as well as uh, the country to study in the United States. And this is around usually around teaching or res research. I was a senior scholar uh, Fulbright award winner, and what that allowed me to do is sponsored me 
to go to an, uh, another country, it was Indonesia, and help with the educational programs, the teaching programs. So in 2000, I was awarded a Fulbright in Indonesia, and of course it's so close, and you have to go through Singapore, so I visited Singapore many times during my year as a Fulbrighter. Um, but you can imagine the time in Indonesia, although Indonesia is quite a bit different than, than Singapore, the time in Indonesia was an opportunity to get to know academics in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. get a sense of how things work. Here. So when you were there, you must have been visiting Singapore and Absolutely. flying through Singapore. Yes, okay. many times. So how did they convince you to come over to Singapore? Obviously, you knew it, you liked the food, you liked the place, <laughs> but there must have been another reason why you came over. Well, if you ask the Singaporeans, either the food or shopping, right? right. But, but you uh, were not into no, shopping. <laughs> no, okay. not into so much the shopping. What it was for me, was that um, because I knew Singapore so well, I knew that the school would actually happen. Okay, I was convinced that the school would happen. Um, as you know, these kinds of international ventures are very, very challenging. So much can go wrong, so much can happen. And, uh, and, I, I, and when I was hired, I think there were only seven people here so the school was very, very new. I was the first person hired in education. And so um, a lot of people said, wow, Bob, you're taking such a risk because you've been in an established position at UCSF. You know, it was a great training program there that you had. Um, but I was, very, I, was, uh, I was very comfortable with the idea that this project was going to happen and it was going to be great. And so I moved to Singapore because it's not very often that someone in education has a chance to start a medical school. And not only, and I wouldn't have left UCSF for just any medical school. Uh, the, really, the idea was that we felt that we could achieve one of the best medical schools in the world here in Singapore. And that was the kind of challenge that was going to be interesting enough for me to move from my from my position in San Francisco. So did you really know what you were getting into? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I guess ignorance is bliss in a lot of ways. Uh, there's, there's so many things that uh, were a surprise, but that's, um, uh, to me, that's all part of the territory. And so um, I, I really c came in, I think, uh, feeling that this was going to be a great adventure this was going to be a great challenge. And there were going to be things that cropped up that I was going to be surprised by. But that wasn't going to take away from the experience. That the experience was really about, and I was so fortunate to have a great group of, of people come with me um, to start, you know, Sandy Cook and Frank Starmer. There are this small group of folks who really came to start the school were, were really the the best group of educators I've worked ever worked with. So when you came, uh, the first thing was to get to know Duke yeah. and move the curriculum over. Yeah. How did this whole process work? How, what do, you re do you remember much of it? <laughs> like, I remember like it was yesterday. So um, I think at the time, uh, and you know this better than I, I, I do, Ranga, that there was a lot of skepticism about Singapore at Duke, Duke and Durham. And there was a lot of concern that it was going to take away from the mission of the school, all the things that were going on at, at, in Durham. The school in Singapore was going to be a dis major distraction, and that there wasn't going to be, that Duke wasn't going to get enough out of this to make it worthwhile. And when I started, the, I think in education, they, the, the idea was that, that Duke was going to be like Cornell School in Qatar. Now, Cornell School in Qatar was three years, four, three or four years uh, uh, ahead of, of Singapore. And what the, Cornell's approach to it was basically, we're going to take the professors from Cornell. We're going to fly them to the Middle East. They're going to give the lecture, teach the students, and then come back to Cornell. And I think when I started, that was the idea that most of the, many of the education faculty at Duke had that was going to happen in Singapore. The problem with that is that I wasn't happy with that, that idea. I felt that that strategy was a terrible strategy um, and that we really wanted to build something. I felt that like we can build something great here, but I didn't know what. 
So I, um, in addition, uh, what was what was said and was given to me was that uh, that you'll have Duke faculty who can come over to Singapore, but if you can't convince Duke faculty to come, we'll have videotapes for them. And I thought that also wasn't a good idea. But the videotapes were going to be important because it kept us aligned with what Duke was doing in North Carolina. So that uh, the use of the videotapes were going to be an important way to really prove to everyone that we were indeed teaching the Duke curriculum, at least in the first year. So the problem was, I had these videotapes. Um, the idea was that these videotapes were going to be played, or the faculty were going to come over, and then we're going to give the same tests as the Duke students. And that was going to be the first year. And I knew that that was, going, that was a terrible idea. I knew that that wasn't going to be able to track the top students that I really felt the school could attract. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as, um, as this was processing in my head, I came upon um, a teaching technique that was used in the 60s, first developed in business school education, which basically asked the students to prepare ahead of time, and then in class learn the material, apply them in teams. And I realized when I when I kind of ran uh, ran uh, upon this that this was perfect. This was exactly what we needed to do um, in Singapore to really create something uh, great here. And uh, and it was again a bit of a risk to start something completely new here in Singapore. But I felt that this would create something very unique for the school. This, would, this was the right way to educate students, especially students who were being expected to think um, out of the box, be innovative, be creative. Um, I felt that the standard lecture, take the test, was not going to groom that in our students, and that, um, that that we really weren't going to be successful unless we did this new way of teaching. So um, again, I was, I was so lucky to have a group of faculty, as we started here, come on board with that idea. Because obviously, um, create, when I started, we had 15 months mm -hmm. before the start, students started. So to do all of this, to bring a curriculum over, not only bring it over, but really rethink how to do it in 15 months. That was incredibly ambitious. And um, there were some concerns back at Duke, but I'd also have to say Ed Buckley, who's my counterpart at Duke, really felt as well this was the right way of doing things and was very supportive. So uh, we, we just really pulled it together. And I guess- so It's been a fun ride. It's been terrific. It's been the best time I've ever had. So how did you come up with team lead, the word lead? <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I know it was called GMS. Yeah, team, so, um, so, uh, so when we started, the school was known fondly as GMS, Graduate Medical School, which, which uh, set us up differently than the YLL School, which was an undergraduate medical school. The problem was, um, as, as you realized when you started, Ranga, that a graduate medical school means different things to so many different people. And that because of that, because some people think it's residency training and other people think it's medical school. And so because of that confusion, you made the decision um, to really be, have us known as Duke NUS rather than uh, GMS. So we had initially, because we were known as GMS, we initially called the teaching method Team GMS. But uh, really to go along this idea that we really couldn't be known as GMS anymore, uh, we, had to, we had to think about the next, how we were going to call ourselves. And so we thought, well, Team Duke NUS, was that right? And um, we just weren't happy with that. So I can remember again very dis distinctly, um, Sandy Cook and I decided, okay, we're going to spend a Saturday morning just brainstorming of what to call it. And so we went to, um, we went to the library at the American Club and sat there and just brainstormed together for about three hours and came up with Team Lead. And part of the fun with this, and one of the things that, uh, that you've picked up was true, was that we've tried to have fun with this uh, throughout the time that I've been here. And we sort of uh, realized that um, Team Lead, if it didn't really work out, if we really couldn't make it happen, we could call it 
instead of lead, we can call it lead, mm -hmm. like it was a lead balloon. But fortunately, we didn't have to. So we, could, we could call it team lead. Yeah. Now, looking forward, I think the team leaders worked great for the first year. But uh, as we have talked, the clinical years right. is still all over the globe. Right. No one has really come up with a good strategy for making it what it could be. Right, that's so our new frontier. That's, that's, we've learned so much from doing team lead in the first year, and our students really became quite good at it and really learned um, above and beyond we were, that we were expecting. In fact, before I answer your question, I'll just uh, make a side note that, that really uh, surprised, I think, the world, surprised the Duke faculty that our students were learning so well with, this, uh, with team lead. And that was what I think was the thing that persuaded Duke to really try to also do, teach them this way. Um, it wasn't going to be enough just to see it and it's the latest thing. Um, but the Duke faculty really demanded that they have data that our students can learn better. And, that, and we were able to provide that to them. So as you know, uh, the medical school at Duke, as well as undergraduate, many of the undergraduate classes are really using our experience to try to to, to influence the way that new ways that they're trying to teach the, their students. So that's fantastic. And you were at Duke a couple of weeks ago, right? To talk about the next phase, the clinical yeah. side. Yeah. So, so, le so let me get back to your, your question then. So the really the latest frontier is that we've been teaching um, uh, similar to the way that Duke has been teaching the clinical, um, the clinical uh, courses. And that hasn't changed in what, 30, could be long more, time. 40, long 50 time. years. <laughs> That's been a long time it's been taught that way. And we've not taken advantage of the technology that we have to deliver education. We've not taken advantage of things that we've learned ahead of time in, in terms of how students learn well. So um, as you're alluding to, the latest frontier is bringing our experience of team lead into the clinical arena. And, and last week, we, uh, we took a number of our faculty here from in Singapore who teach this, the students in the clinical years and brought them to Duke. We were in the Duke's new, brand new education building, which was really special, and worked with the Duke clinical faculty around a couple of different areas, which I think were quite exciting. And one is, how do you use the technology to deliver education and then allow faculty not to not teach, but to teach different things that they would have liked to be able to teach, but didn't have time to teach. So the idea is uh, that we've created, um, using the technology that we developed to deliver videos to our students in the first year. And these are more than just videos. These are video plots. This is the, our uh, voice annotated presentations, or VAPs. Um, use that technology to deliver uh, 10 minute bites of clinical information to students. And we chose 10 minutes because we think that's around the, the attention span of most physicians. But, uh, um, but by, giving, uh, by developing um, these 10 minute sound bites for uh, students, they could, while they're waiting uh, for a lab um, test to come back or there's their patient to come out of surgery, that they can go through and they can learn in the lecture and that would free up the faculty from not get, uh, from giving that, not giving that lecture to instead working with the students how to apply that information, how to apply that to a clinical scenario. So really help the students understand um, the connection between that lecture, which is mostly theory, mostly examples, to their real life example, the patient. That's in so basically them. moving from just knowing something to learning how to use it and apply Right, it. so okay. this is, I think from our first year, we understand that is something, um, a critical piece of, about the, the way that we educate the students, that we separate out knowing something, and people can know it and memorize it and regurgitate it back, but actually being able to apply and do something with it. That's a different level of understanding. And so w we've learned a lot about that in the first year. Now we're trying to apply that to the second year. So before we wrap up, uh, one question. Is there something that we don't know about you, the students and others, that you'd like to share? Oh, my something gosh. Something that will be interesting. <laughs> Just to put you, you on the should, spot. You should have warned me about that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If, uh, uh, 
What, what is it that uh, something that you think would inspire the students from your own life and your career? Uh, because I think one of the big problems in education is getting people to follow yeah. in the footsteps of education. It's a little bit right. easier for research. Right. And clearly, uh, most people know they want to be clinicians. But Right, the education part. So what? So I don't know if this is a hidden secret or not. I doubt it's not a hidden secret. But I think to, to answer your question, um, is that I've always been known in education to be willing to do something that's been different. Um, when we uh, back at my my previous job, um, I would suggest things to our faculty that they would be uh, scratching their head and upset about, but. Five years later, after we implemented it, everyone was pleased that it happened. So for example, uh, we used to teach, uh, we had a pediatric residency. It was a great pediatric residency. But one of the things that I realized is that the real problems in, in, for child health in the United States wasn't around um, that latest, that, that, that tumor or that strange disease but instead around uh, policy and around ch children's health. And that pediatricians really did, did need to be on the table to direct and influence child health, as well as doing the research in, in pediatric cancer. And so really whatever. get involved in the policy as and the well, operational aspects. Because, that's, yeah. because the world needed pediatricians to, be a, to influence things. So we created a new residency um, um, around that where people would get a pediatric clinical training but at the same time get the policy and leadership trainings to be able to make that um, that change so that's an example of, of something that was a little out of the was way out of the box at the time um, but something that I've always tried to make a part of my career so team lead is another example of that and but let me frame it this way you knew from childhood what you wanted to be but a lot of people if you ask them even later in life don't talk about being educators. How do you inspire the next generation to become educators? Well, uh, it's a tough question, but everyone, that is the reason I'm asking. Yeah, everyone everyone uh, should consider, that, and I'm talking about, about life in general, not just uh, medicine or, or pediatrics, uh, but everyone should really consider themselves an educator and a learner, and a lifelong learner. and. Teaching something is the same way of learning something. And so, uh, so one of the things that uh, maybe uh, goes along with this really willingness to do something different is that I've always been interested in learning something different and knowing something and being able to apply that in different ways. So, um, so that's come out as someone who's been willing to be out of the box and try different things and be a little bit of a maverick at times um, to implement different things and do different things. And so if you look at my career, um, yes, uh, I started when I was little being a pediatrician, but the pediatrician that I have been throughout my career is not your standard pediatrician. So the advice that I would um, really give um, people who are listening to this would be that um, you should be constantly evaluating um, and thinking about how you might do something different. Don't be satisfied with doing things the same old way, including your career. Look for the ways that you can really uh, continue to grow in your career and, and it, it will be so satisfying as a career if you're able to accomplish that. So something different brings me to what people know about you on YouTube, basketball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, I'm not really a basketball player, and the story about that is a funny story. Uh, we were in a cab together with your daughter, who's a huge Duke fan. In, in fact, a, a Duke, I mean Duke basketball fan and scholar, right? She knows every fact about Duke basketball. So we were talking about um, this latest YouTube video that Kyle Singler had did, who's one of the basketball stars at, at Duke at the time, where he was shooting off the chapel and over Duke campus and making incredible basketball shots. And it was at that, um, at, it, in that taxi ride where you know, we talked about, well, wouldn't it be fun to do that around um, Duke NUS? And so we went ahead and filmed it 
did that in a couple hours. I don't really consider myself a basketball player, um, but I was uh, lucky enough to get a couple of sh uh, those shots in. I, people say, I don't understand how you fake the ball <laughs> go through it. And I said, no, I, I actually did make them. But, um, uh, but again, it was just that uh, things that um, I think that's come up in this conversation about really having fun, uh, not taking ourselves too seriously, but being really great at um, and uh, uh, trying to work hard and be great at what we do, do things a little bit differently, and good things happen. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome.